Introduction of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mihai Borobocha. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow by Adelbert von Chamisso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge, edited with introduction and notes by William R. Alger. Introduction It is over three quarters of a century since Chamisso published his romantic and symbolic story of Peter Schlemiel, the man who lost his shadow. It was received with a general favor that gave it immediate celebrity. It has been translated into almost every modern language and has passed through so many editions that it is now fully established as one of the little classics of the world. It is so widely known, there are in current literature so many allusions to it, and it is freighted with so much interest and instruction that it has a good claim to be read by every educated person. The realistic power with which the tale is constructed the stereoscopic distinctness of the characters, the naturalness and consistency of the incidents, the wit and humor with which the pages abound, give the work an attractive charm amply sufficient of itself to carry the reader delightedly along from the beginning to the end. In addition to this, there is a bewitching mystery in the fundamental idea of the story. The narrative is a series of latent riddles loaded with enigmatical morals. Just what those morals are, it is somewhat difficult to explain. Perhaps the author intended to leave this aspect of his artistic creation wrapped in indefiniteness on purpose, to provoke the mental activity of his readers, that each one might get at the significance of the work for himself. It is well known that Goethe was in the habit of saying, when asked what he meant to teach by a particular poem or tale, that it had no definite didactic purpose. He declared that he wished to convey in it all that his readers could discover, either in the words or between the lines, and that he expected the result to be as varied as the talents and acquirements brought to the task of interpretation. No doubt, however, there will be many readers of The Strange Adventures of Peter Schlemiel who will be glad to receive a little help in understanding the real meaning of the chief incident in the experience of the central personage, namely, the loss of his shadow. The critical reader will find that this artistic and weird narrative is at once a romantic idyll, an ethical apologue, a witty satire, and a philosophical parable. These points shall now be briefly shown, and later on, further elucidated in the notes. In the outset, it is quite obvious that the thought of the writer is not confined to the literal shadow itself. Deeper than this, and far more important, there is hidden a parallel spiritual significance. What is, then, the metaphorical moral correspondence of the physical shadow thrown by a human body when it intercepts the light? The reputation of a man among those familiar with him is the shadow cast by his character. This is the idea they entertain of him. When he goes to a foreign place, where he is a stranger, he carries no reputation. He has lost his moral shadow. The impervious ignorance prevalent concerning him there prevents the appearance of any adumbration of what he is. For where there is no light to be intercepted, no shadow can be thrown. Shadows are alike impossible in complete darkness and in universal radiance. It is because when a man is with his acquaintances, his character is partly known and partly unknown, has one aspect illuminated and one darkened, that he flings a shadow. This shadow is his social repute. But when he appears in a new place, where he is a total stranger, 
he no longer possesses this. And to be wholly without repute is to be unlike those around you. And to be unlike your fellows is to be cut off from sympathetic union with them, and to be regarded askance with suspicion and with fear. Hence the distress of Peter Schlemil. A more profound thought connected with the subject is that he who casts no shadow thereby proves that he is himself no substance. He who fronts the light with the background behind him and yet remains shadowless is transparent to the day. The day shines through him. He, therefore, cannot belong to the order of living men, but must be some kind of supernatural or preternatural being. Accordingly, he is isolated from the wholesome class of normal creatures, who shrink from the uncanny phenomenon with terror. Hence, again, the suffering and grief occasioned to Peter Schlemiel by the loss of his shadow, which, although in itself it seems to be nothing, is still a sign indicative of much to those who can interpret it. But, after all, the principal lesson of the narrative is the lesson of the comparative value of things. As between spirit and matter, which is the enduring reality and which the elusive phantom? As between outward show and inward worth, which is the shadow and which the substance? In one passage of his work, Shamiso represents Peter as being much displeased with the company of persons who spoke seriously of trifles and triflingly of serious things. This is the keynote. Things are to be esteemed according to their genuine values, not according to their mere appearance. Peter himself practiced the inverse of this when he sold the companionable index of his personality for a copious supply of gold. And bitterly did he rue his folly for he soon learned that peace of mind and friendly communion with his fellow men on equal terms were the incomparable good of life, the veritable substance, whereof money was merely a hollow symbol. On the whole, then, the supreme lesson inculcated by the experience of Peter Schlemiel is this. What a man is creates his reputation. His reputation is what other people think of him. That they should think well of him is one of the most important elements of his happiness. His social shadow is the projection of his personal character. This index may be mistaken or changed or taken away, but his genuine character is incommunicably his own property. Character cannot, like money, be indiscriminately exchanged among men. However its outward indications may be confused, however its conventional accomplishments may be altered or forfeited, it is itself the intrinsic reality, the invaluable solid. Therefore it must never be subordinated to anything else, nor its appropriate signal be bartered away for any seductive counterfeit. In most cases, man is not what he thinks he is. In many cases, he is not what others think him. In every case, he is what God thinks him. The true desideratum is that he shall himself know just what he is and aspire to become what God would have him be. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adalbert von Chamisso. Translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 1. After a fortunate but for me very troublesome voyage, we finally reached the port. 
the instant that i touched land in the boat i loaded myself with my few effects and passing through the swarming people i entered the first and least house before which i saw a sign hang i requested a room the servants measured me with a look and conducted me into the garret i caused fresh water to be brought and made him exactly describe to me where i should find mr thomas john for the north gate the first country house on the right hand a large new house of red and white marble with many columns good it was still early in the day i opened at once my bundle took thence my new black cloth coat clad myself cleanly in my best apparel put my letter of introduction into my pocket and sat out on the way to the man who was to promote my modest expectations when i had ascended the long north street and reached the gate i soon saw the pillars glimmer through the foliage here it is then thought i i wiped the dust from my feet with my pocket handkerchief and put my neckcloth in order and rang the bell the door flew open in the hall i had an examination to undergo the porter however permitted me to be announced and i had the honour to be called into the park where mr john was walking with a select party i recognised the man at once by the lustre of his corpulent self-complacency he received me very well as a rich man receives a poor fellow even turned towards me without turning from the rest of the company and took the offered letter from my hand so so from my brother i have heard nothing from him for a long time but he is well there continued he addressing the company without waiting for an answer and pointing with the letter to a hill there i am going to erect the new building footnote here and in what follows through the opening chapter the author indicates with a satirical subtlety the contrast in the manners of the rich toward the poor and those of the poor toward the rich the antithesis of insolence and obsequiousness he thus prepares the way for his central theme namely the inverted relation in human life of worth and esteem truth and seeme milton noticed the fact that the self-sufficiency bred by the habit of looking down upon inferiors often leads to a neglect of thoughtful and sympathetic attention he says courtesy is sooner found in lowly sheds with smoky rafters than in tapestry halls and courts of princes where it first was named End footnote. he broke the seal without breaking off the conversation which turned upon riches he that is not master of a million at least he observed is pardon me the word a wretch oh how true i exclaimed with a rush of overflowing feeling that pleased him he smiled at me and said stay here my good friend in a while i shall perhaps have time to tell you what i think about this he pointed to the letter which he then thrust into his pocket and turned again to the company he offered his arm to a young lady the other gentlemen addressed themselves to the fair ones each found what suited him and all proceeded towards the rose-blossomed mount i slid into the rear without troubling any one for no one troubled himself any further about me the company was excessively lively there was dalliance and playfulness trifles were sometimes discussed with an important tone but oftener important matters with levity and especially pleasantry flowed the wit over absent friends and their circumstances i was too strange to understand much of all this too anxious and introverted to take an interest in such riddles we had reached the rosary the lovely fanny the belle of the day as it appeared would out of obstinacy herself break off a blooming bow she wounded herself on a thorn and as if from the dark roses flowed the purple on her tender hand this circumstance put the whole party into a flutter english plaster was sought for a still thin lanky longish oldish man who stood near and whom i had not hitherto remarked put his hand instantly into the close lined breast pocket of his old french grey taffety coat produced thence a little pocket-book opened it and presented to the lady with a profound obeisance the required article she took it without noticing the giver and without thanks footnote an example of the impoliteness often practised in polite society and footnote the wound was bound up and we went forward over the hill from whose back the company could enjoy the wide prospect over the green labyrinth of the park to the boundless ocean the view was in reality vast and splendid 
a light point appeared on the horizon between the dark flood and the blue of the heaven a telescope here cried john and already before the servants who appeared at the call were in motion the gray man modestly bowing had thrust his hand into his coat pocket and drawn thence a beautiful dolland and handed it to mr john bringing it immediately to his eye he informed the company that it was the ship which went out yesterday and was detained in view of port by contrary winds the telescope passed from hand to hand but not again into that of its owner i however gazed in wonder at the man and could not conceive how the great machine had come out of the narrow pocket but this seemed to have struck no one else and nobody troubled himself any further about the gray man than about him myself refreshments were handed round the choicest fruits of every zone in the costliest vessels mr john did the honors with an easy grace and a second time addressed a word to me help yourself you have not had the like at sea i bowed but he saw it not he was already speaking with some one else the company would fain have reclined upon the sword on the slope of the hill opposite to the outstretched landscape had they not feared the dampness of the earth it were divine observed one of the party but we had but a turkey carpet to spread here the wish was scarcely expressed when the man in the grey coat had his hand in his pocket and was busied in drawing thence with a modest and even humble deportment a rich turkey carpet interwoven with gold the servants received it as a matter of course and opened it on the required spot the company without ceremony took their places upon it for myself i looked again in amazement on the man at the carpet which measured above twenty paces long and ten in breadth and rubbed my eyes not knowing what to think of it especially as nobody saw anything extraordinary in it i would fain have had some explanation regarding the man and have asked who he was but i knew not to whom to address myself for i was almost more afraid of the gentleman's servants than of the served gentleman at length i took courage and stepped up to a young man who appeared to me to be of less consideration than the rest and who had often stood alone i begged him softly to tell me who the agreeable man in the grey coat there was he there who looks like an end of thread that has escaped out of a tailor's needle footnote a wit quite like that embodied by shakespeare in the speeches of falstaff End footnote. yes he stands alone i don't know him he replied and as it seemed in order to avoid a longer conversation with me he turned away and spoke of indifferent matters to another the sun began now to shine more powerfully and to inconvenience the ladies the lovely fanny addressed carelessly to the gray man whom as far as i am aware no one had yet spoken to the trifling question whether he had not perchance also a tent by him he answered her by an obeisance almost profound as if an unmerited honour were done him and had already his hand in his pocket out of which i saw some canvas bowls cordage ironwork in short everything which belongs to the most splendid pleasure tent the young gentleman helped to expand it and it covered the whole extent of the carpet and nobody found anything remarkable in it i was already become uneasy nay horrified at heart but how completely so as at the very next wish expressed i saw him yet pull out of his pocket three roadsters i tell thee three beautiful great black horses with saddle and caparison bethink thee three saddled horses still out of the same pocket out of which already a pocket-book a telescope an embroidered carpet twenty paces long and ten broad a pleasure tent of equal dimensions and all the requisite poles and irons to come forth if i did not protest to thee that i saw it myself with my own eyes thou couldst not possibly believe it embarrassed and obsequious as the man himself appeared to be little as was the attention which had been bestowed upon him yet to me his grisly aspect from which i could not turn my eyes became so fearful that i could bear it no longer i resolved to steal away from the company which from the insignificant part i played in it seemed to me an easy affair i proposed to myself to return to the city to try my luck again on the morrow with mr john and if i could muster the necessary courage to question him about the singular gray man had i only had the good fortune to escape so well i had already actually succeeded in stealing through the rosary and in descending the hill 
found myself on a piece of lawn when fearing to be encountered in crossing the grass out of the path i cast an inquiring glance around me what was my terror to behold the man in the gray coat behind me and making towards me in the next moment he took off his hat before me and bowed so low as no one had ever yet done to me there was no doubt that he wished to address me and without being rude i could not prevent it i also took off my hat bowed also and stood there in the sun with bare head as if rooted to the ground i stared at him full of terror and was like a bird which a serpent has fascinated he himself appeared very much embarrassed he raised not his eyes again bowed repeatedly drew near and addressed me with a soft tremulous voice almost in a tone of supplication may i hope sir that you will pardon my boldness in venturing in so unusual a manner to approach you but i would ask a favour permits me most condescendingly but alas exclaimed i in my trepidation what can i do for a man who we both started and as i believe reddened after a moment's silence he again resumed during the short time that i have had the happiness to find myself near you i have sir many times allow me to say it to you really contemplated with inexpressible admiration the beautiful beautiful shadow which as it were with a certain noble disdain and without yourself remarking it you cast from you in the sunshine the noble shadow at your feet there pardon me the bold supposition but possibly you might not be indisposed to make this shadow over to me i was silent and the mill wheel seemed to whirl round in my head what was i to make of this singular proposition to sell my own shadow he must be mad thought i and with an altered tone which was more assimilated to that of his own humility i answered thus ha good friend have not you then enough of your own shadow i take this for a business of a very singular sort he hastily interrupted me i have many things in my pocket which sir might not appear worthless to you and for this inestimable shadow i hold the very highest price too small it struck cold through me again as i was reminded of the pocket i knew not how i could have called him good friend i resumed the conversation and sought if possible to set all right again by excessive politeness but sir pardon your most humble servants i do not understand your meaning how indeed could my shadow he interrupted me i beg your permission only here on the spot to be allowed to take up this noble shadow and put it in my pocket how i shall do that be my care on the other hand as a testimony of my grateful acknowledgment to you i give you the choice of all the treasures which i carry in my pocket the genuine spring root footnote these are references to facts in the popular tales of germany as for instance the spring wurzel or spring root is found in the story of rubizal and the galgen menle or gallows men were little figures cut out of a root said by the dealers and such things in the middle ages to be actual mandrake roots growing in the shape at the foot of a gallows and footnote the mandrake root the change penny the rob dollar the napkin of roland's page a mandrake man at your own price but these probably don't interest you rather fortunus's wishing cap newly and stoutly repaired and a lucky bag such as he had the luck purse of fortunatus i exclaimed interrupting him and great as my anxiety was with that one word he had taken my whole mind captive a dizziness seized me and double ducats seemed to glitter before my eyes honoured sir will you do me the favour to view and to make trial of this purse he thrust his hand into his pocket and drew out a tolerably large well-sewed purse of stout cordon leather with two strong strings and handed it to me i plunged my hand into it and drew out ten gold pieces and again ten and again ten and again ten i extended him eagerly my hand agreed the business is done for the purse you have my shadow he closed with me kneeled instantly down before me and i beheld him with an admirable dexterity gently loosen my shadow from top to toe from the grass lift it up roll it together fold it and finally pocket it he arose made me another obeisance and retreated towards the rosary i fancied that i heard him there softly laughing to himself but i held the purse fast by the strings all round me lay the clear sunshine and within me was yet no power of reflection 
End of chapter 1. Recording by Ashley M. Chapter 2 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mihai Borobocha. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adelbert von Chamiso. Translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 2 At length I came to myself and hastened to quit the place where I had nothing more to expect. In the first place I filled my pockets with gold. Then I secured the strings of the purse fast round my neck and concealed the purse itself in my bosom. I passed unobserved out of the park, reached the highway and took the road to the city. As, sunk in thought, I approached the gate, I heard a cry behind me. Young gentleman, a uh, young gentleman, hear you? I looked round. An old woman called after me. Do take care, sir. You have lost your shadow. Thank you, good mother. I threw her a gold piece for her well-meant intelligence and stopped under the trees. At the city gate, I was compelled to hear again from the sentinel, where has the gentleman left his shadow? And immediately again from some women, alas, the poor fellow has no shadow. That began to irritate me, and I became especially careful not to walk in the sun. This could not, however, be accomplished everywhere. For instance, over the broad street which I next must approach, actually as mischief would have it at the very moment that the boys came out of school a little rogue i see him yet spied out instantly that i had no shadow he proclaimed the fact with a loud outcry to the whole assembled literary street youth of the suburb who began forthwith to criticize me and to pelt me with mud decent people are accustomed to take their shadow with them when they go into the sunshine to defend myself from them, I threw whole handfuls of gold amongst them and sprang into a hackney coach which some compassionate soul procured for me. As soon as I found myself alone in the rolling carriage, I began to weep bitterly. The presentiment must already have arisen in me that, far as gold on earth transcends in estimation, merit and virtue, so much higher than gold itself is the shadow valued. And as I had earlier sacrificed wealth to conscience, I had now thrown away the shadow for mere gold. What in the world could and would become of me? I was again greatly annoyed as the carriage stopped before my old inn. I was horrified at the bare idea of entering that wretched loft. I ordered my things to be brought down, received my miserable bundle with contempt, threw down some gold pieces, and ordered the coachman to drive to the most fashionable hotel. The house faced the north, and I had not the sun to fear. I dismissed the driver with gold, caused the best front rooms to be assigned me, and shut myself up in them as quickly as I could. What thinkest thou I now began? Oh, my dear Shamiso, to confess it even to thee makes me blush. I drew the unlucky purse from my bosom, and with a kind of desperation which, like a rushing conflagration, grew in me with self-increasing growth, I extracted gold and gold and gold and even more gold and strewed it on the floor and strode amongst it and made it ring again and, feeding my poor heart on the splendor and the sound, flung continually more metal to metal, till in my weariness I sank down on the rich heap, and rioting thereon rolled and reveled amongst it. So passed the day, the evening. I opened not my door, night and day found me lying on my gold, and then sleep overcame me. 
I dreamed of thee. I seemed to stand behind the glass door of thy little room and to see thee sitting there at thy work table between a skeleton and a bundle of dried plants. Before thee laid open Haller, Humboldt and Linnaeus. On thy sofa a volume of Goethe and the Magic Ring. Footnote. A novel by Baron de la Motte Fouc. End footnote. I regarded thee long, and everything in thy room, and then thee again. Thou didst not move. Thou drewest no breath. Thou wert dead. I awoke. It appeared still to be very early. My watch had stopped. I was sore all over. Thirsty and hungry, too. I had taken nothing since the evening before. I pushed from me with loathing and indignation the gold on which I had before sated my foolish heart. In my vexation I knew not what I should do with it. It must not lie there. I tried whether the purse would swallow it again, but no. None of my windows opened upon the sea. I found myself compelled laboriously to drag it to a great cupboard which stood in a cabinet and there to pile it. I left only some handfuls of it lying. When I had finished the work, I threw myself exhausted into an easy chair and waited for the stirring of the people in the house. As soon as possible, I ordered food to be brought and the landlord to come to me. I fixed in consultation with this man the future arrangements of my house. He recommended for the services about my person a certain Bendel, whose honest and intelligent physiognomy immediately captivated me. He it was whose attachment has since accompanied me consolingly through the wretchedness of life and has helped me to support my gloomy lot. I spent the whole day in my room among masterless servants, shoemakers, tailors and tradespeople. I fitted myself out and purchased besides a great many jewels and valuables for the sake of getting rid of some of the vast heap of hoarded up gold, but it seemed to me as if it were impossible to diminish it. In the meantime, I brooded over my situation in the most agonizing despair. I dared not venture a step out of my doors, and that evening I caused forty wax lights to be lit in my room before I issued from the shade. I thought with horror on the terrible scene with the schoolboys, yet I resolved, much courage as it demanded, once more to make a trial of public opinion. The nights were then moonlight. Late in the evening I threw on a white cloak, pressed my hat over my eyes and stole, trembling like a criminal, out of the house. I stepped first out of the shade in whose protection I had arrived there, in a remote square, into the full moonlight, determined to learn my fate out of the mouths of the passers-by. Spare me, dear friend, the painful repetition of all that I had to endure. The women often testified the deepest compassion with which I inspired them declarations which no less transpierced me than the mockery of the youth and the proud contempt of the men, especially of those fat, well-fed fellows who themselves cast a broad shadow. A lovely and sweet girl, who, as it seemed, accompanied her parents, while they suspiciously only looked before their feet, turned by chance her flashing eyes upon me. She was obviously terrified. She observed my want of a shadow, let fall her veil over her beautiful countenance, and, dropping her head, passed in silence. I could bear it no longer. Briny streams started from my eyes, and, cut to the heart, I staggered back into the shade. I was obliged to support myself against the houses to steady my steps, and wearily and late reached my dwelling. I spent a sleepless night. The next morning it was my first care to have the man in the grey coat everywhere sought after. Possibly I might succeed in finding him again, 
and how joyfully he repented of the foolish bargain as heartedly as I did. I ordered Bendel to come to me. He appeared to possess a dress and tact. I described to him exactly the man in whose possession lay a treasure without which my life was only a misery. I told him the time, the place in which I had seen him. I described to him all who had been present and added, moreover, this token. He should particularly inquire after a Dolan's telescope, after a gold interwoven Turkish carpet, after a splendid pleasure tent, and finally after the black chargers, whose story, we know not how, was connected with that of the mysterious man who seemed of no consideration amongst them, and whose appearance had destroyed the quiet and happiness of my life. When I had done speaking, I fetched out gold, such a load that I was scarcely able to carry it, and laid upon it precious stones and jewels of a far greater value. Bendel, said I, these level many ways and make easy many things which appeared quite impossible. Don't be stingy with it, as I am not but go and rejoice thy master with the intelligence on which his only hope depends. He went. He returned late and sorrowful. None of the people of Mr. John, none of his guests, and he had spoken with all, were able in the remotest degree to recollect the man in the grey coat. The new telescope was there, and no one knew whence it had come. The carpet, the tent were still there, spread and pitched on the selfsame hill. The servants boasted of the affluence of their master, and no one knew whence these same valuables had come to him. He himself took his pleasure in them, and did not trouble himself because he did not know whence he had them, the young gentlemen had the horses which they had ridden in their stables, and they praised the liberality of Mr. John, who on that day made them a present of them. Thus much was clear from the circumstantial relation of Bendel, whose active zeal and able proceeding, although with such fruitless result, received from me their merited commendation. I gloomily motioned him to leave me alone. I have, began he again, given my master an account of the matter which was most important to him. I have yet a message to deliver, which a person gave me whom I met at the door as I went out on the business in which I have been so unfortunate. The very words of the man were these. Tell Mr. Peter Schlemiel he will not see me here again as I am going over sea, and a favorable wind calls me at this moment to the harbor. But in a year and a day, I will have the honor to seek him myself, and then to propose to him another and probably to him more agreeable transaction. Present my most humble compliments to him, and assure him of my thanks. I asked him who he was, but he replied your honor knew him already. What was the man's appearance? cried I, filled with foreboding. And Pendle sketched to me the man in the grey coat, trait by trait, word for word, as he had accurately described in his former relation the man after whom he had inquired. Unhappy one! I exclaimed, wringing my hands. That was the very man! And there fell, as it were, scales from his eyes. Yes, it was he. It was... Positively, cried he in horror. And I, blind and imbecile wretch, have not recognized him have not recognized him and have betrayed my master. He broke out into violent weeping, heaped the bitterest reproaches on himself, and the despair in which he was, 
inspired even me with compassion. I spoke comfort to him, assured him repeatedly that I entertained not the slightest doubt of his fidelity, and sent him instantly to the port, if possible to follow the traces of this singular man. But in the morning, a great number of ships which the contrary winds had detained in the harbor had run out, bound to different climes and different shores, and the gray man had vanished as tracelessly as a dream. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of the Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, the Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, the Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adelbert von Chamisso. Translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 3 of what avail are wings to him who is fast bound in iron fetters he is compelled only the more fearfully to despair i lay like fafner by his treasure very far from every consolation suffering much in the midst of my gold but my heart was not in it on the contrary i cursed it because i saw myself through it cut off from all life brooding over my gloomy secret alone i tremble before the meanest of my servants whom at the same time I was forced to envy, for he had a shadow. He might show himself in the sun. I wore away days and nights in solitary sorrow in my chamber, and anguish gnawed at my heart. There was another who pined away before my eyes. My faithful Bendel never ceased to torture himself with silent reproaches that he had betrayed the trust reposed in him by his master, and had not recognized him after whom he was dispatched and with whom he must believe that my sorrowful fate was intimately interwoven. I could not lay the fault to his charge. I recognized in the event the mysterious nature of the unknown. That I might leave nothing untried, I one time sent Bendel with a valuable brilliance ring to the most celebrated painter of the city, and begged that he would pay me a visit. He came. I ordered my people to retire, closed the door, seated myself by the man, and after I had praised his art, I came with a heavy heart to the business, causing him before that to promise the strictest secrecy. Mr. Professor, said I, could not you, think you, paint a false shadow for one who, by the most unlucky chance in the world, has become deprived of his own? You mean a personal shadow? That is precisely my meaning. But, continued he, through what awkwardness... Through what negligence could he then lose his proper shadow? How it happened, replied I, is now of very little consequence, but thus far I may say, added I, lying shamelessly to him, in Russia, whither he made a journey last winter, in an extraordinary cold his shadow froze so fast to the ground that he could by no means loose it again. The false shadow that I could paint him, replied the professor, would only be such a one as by the slightest agitation he might lose again, especially a person who, as appears by your relation, has so little adhesion to his own native shadow. He who has no shadow, let him keep out of the sunshine. That is the safest and most sensible thing for him. He arose and withdrew, casting at me a chance-piercing glance which mine could not support. I sank back in my seat and covered my face with my hands. Thus Fendel found me as he at length entered. He saw the grief of his master and was desirous silently and reverently to withdraw. I looked up. I lay under the burden of my trouble. I must communicate it. Bendel, cried I, Bendel, thou only one who seest my affliction and respectest it, seekest not to pry into it but appearest silently and kindly to sympathize. Come to me, Vandal, and be the nearest to my heart. I have not locked from thee the treasure of my gold, neither will I lock from thee the treasure of my grief. Vandal, forsake me not, Vandal. Thou beholdest me rich, liberal, kind. Thou imaginest that the world ought to honor me, 
and thou seest me fly the world and hide myself from it. Bendel, the world has passed judgment and cast me from it, and perhaps thou too wilt turn from me and thou knowest my fearful secret. Bendel, I am rich, liberal, kind, but alas, I have no shadow. No shadow, cried the good youth from horror, and the bright tears gushed from his eyes. Woe is me that I was born to serve a shadowless master. He was silent and I held my face buried in my hands. Bendel, added I at length, tremblingly, now hast thou my confidence, and now canst thou betray it. Go forth and testify against me. He appeared to be in a heavy conflict with himself. At length he flung himself before me, and seized my hand, which he bathed with his tears. No! exclaimed he. Think the world as it will, I cannot and will not on account of a shadow abandon my kind master. I will act justly, and not with policy. I will continue with you, lend you my shadow, help you when I can, and when I cannot, weep with you. I fell on his neck, astonished at such unusual sentiment, for I was convinced that he did it not for gold. From that time, my fate and my mode of life were in some degree changed. It is indescribable how much Bendel continued to conceal my defect. He was everywhere before me and with me, foreseeing everything, hitting on contrivances, and where danger threatened covering me quickly with a shadow, since he was taller and bulkier than I. Thus I ventured myself again among men, and began to play a part in the world. I was obliged, it is true, to assume many peculiarities and humors. But such became the rich, and so long as the truth continued to be concealed, I enjoyed all the honor and respect which were paid to my wealth. I looked calmly forward to the promised visit of the mysterious unknown at the end of the year and the day. I felt, indeed, that I must not remain longer in a place where I had once been seen without a shadow, and where I might easily be betrayed. Perhaps I yet thought too much of the manner in which I had introduced myself to Thomas John, and it was a mortifying recollection. I would therefore here merely make an experiment, to present myself with more ease and confidence elsewhere. But that now occurred which held me a long time riveted to my vanity, for there it is in the man that the anchor bites the firmest ground. Even the lovely Fanny, whom I in this place again encountered, honored me with some notice without recollecting ever to have seen me before for I now had wit and sense. As I spoke, people listened, and I could not for the life of me comprehend myself how I had arrived at the art of maintaining and engrossing so easily the conversation. But why relate to thee the whole long ordinary story? Thou thyself hast often related it to me of other honorable people. To the old, well-known play in which I good-naturedly undertook a worn-out part, there came in truth to her and me and everybody unexpectedly a most peculiar and poetic catastrophe. As, according to my wont, I had assembled on a beautiful evening a party in the garden. I wandered with the lady arm in arm at some distance from the other guests and exerted myself to strike out pretty speeches for her. She modestly cast down her eyes and gently returned the pressure of my hand, when suddenly the moon broke through the clouds behind me and, she saw only her own shadow thrown forward before her. She started and glanced wildly at me, then again on the earth, seeking my shadow with her eyes, and what passed within her painted itself so singularly on her countenance that I should have burst into a loud laugh if it had not itself run ice cold over my back. I let her fall from my arms in a swoon, shot like an arrow through the terrified guests, reached the door, flung myself into the first chaise which I saw on the stand and drove back to the city, where this time, to my cost, I had left the circumspect Bendel. He was terrified as he saw me. One word revealed to him all. Post-horses were immediately fetched. I took only one of my people with me, an errant knave called Rascal, who had contrived to make himself necessary to me by his cleverness, and who could suspect nothing of the present occurrence. That night I left upwards of a hundred miles behind me. Bendel remained behind me to discharge my establishment, to pay money, and to bring me what I most required. When he overtook me next day, 
i threw myself into his arms and swore to him never again to run into the like folly but in future to be more cautious we continued our journey without pause over the frontiers and the mountains and it was not till we began to descend and had placed those lofty bulwarks between us and our former unlucky abode that i allowed myself to be persuaded to rest from the fatigues i had undergone in a neighboring and little frequented bathing place end of chapter three recording by ashley m chapter four of the wonderful history of peter schlemiel the man who lost his shadow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ashley m the wonderful history of peter schlemiel the man who lost his shadow by adelbert von chamiso translated by frederick henry hedge chapter four footnote this chapter presents a vivid illustration of the histrionic deceits with which human life abounds it shows how often amidst the obscurity and delusive complications of this world men both voluntarily and involuntarily play parts which do not belong to them continually persons are not seen to be what they are but are believed to be what they are not meanwhile the supreme victory and blessedness of man are really to be what he ought to be seem to others to be what he is and be treated accordingly by all End footnote. i must pass in my relation hastily over a time in which how gladly would i linger could i but conjure up the living spirit of it with the recollection but the colour which vivified it and which only can vivify it again is extinguished in me and when i seek in my bosom what then so mightily animated it the grief and the joy the innocent illusion then do i vainly smite a rock in which no living spring now dwells for the god is departed from me how changed does this past time now appear to me i would act in the watering place an heroic character ill studied and myself a novice on the boards and my gaze lured from my part by a pair of blue eyes the parents deluded by the play offer everything only to make the business quickly secure and the poor farce closes in mockery and that is all all that presents itself now to me so absurd and commonplace although it is terrible that that can thus appear to me which then so richly so luxuriantly swelled my bosom mina as i wept at losing thee so weep i still to have lost thee also in myself am i then become so old oh melancholy reason oh but for one pulsation of that time one moment of that illusion but no alone on the high waste sea of thy bitter flood and long out of the last cup of wine the elfin has vanished i have sent forward bendel with some purses of gold to procure for me a dwelling adapted to my needs he had then scattered about much money and expressed himself somewhat indefinitely respecting the distinguished stranger whom he served for i would not be named and that filled the good people with extraordinary fancies as soon as my house was ready bendel returned to conduct me thither we set out about three miles from the place on a sunny plain our progress was obstructed by a gay festal throng the carriage stopped music sound of bells discharge of cannon were heard a loud vivat rent the air before the door of the carriage appeared clad in white a troop of damsels of extraordinary beauty but who were eclipsed by one in particular as the stars of night by the sun she stepped forth from the midst of her sisters the tall and delicate figure kneeled blushing before me and presented to me on a silken cushion a garland woven of laurel olive branches and roses while she uttered some words about majesty veneration and love which i did not understand but whose bewitching silver tone intoxicated my ears and heart it seemed as if the heavenly apparition had some time already passed before me the chorus struck in and sung the praises of a good king and the happiness of his people and this scene my dear friend in the face of the sun she kneeled still only two paces from me and i without a shadow could not spring over the gulf could not also fall on the knee before the angel oh what would i then have given for a shadow i was compelled to hide my shame my anguish my despair deep in the bottom of my carriage 
at length bendel recollected himself on my behalf he leaped out of the carriage on the other side i called him back and gave him out my jewel case which lay at hand a splendid diamond crown which had been made to adorn the brows of the lovely fanny he stepped forward and spoke in the name of his master who could not and would not receive such tokens of homage there must be some mistake and the good people of the city were thanked for their good will as he said this he took up the proffered wreath and laid the brilliant coronet in his place he then extended respectfully his hand to the lovely maiden that she might arise and dismissed with a sign clergy magistrates and all the deputations no one else was allowed to approach he ordered the throng to divide and make way for the horses sprang again into the carriage and on we went at full gallop through a festive archway of foliage and flowers towards the city the discharges of cannon continued the carriage stopped before my house i sprang hastily in at the door dividing the crowd which the desire to see me had collected the mob hurrahed under my window and i let double ducats rain out of it in the evening the city was voluntarily illuminated and yet i did not know at all what all this could mean and who i was supposed to be i sent out rascal to make inquiry he brought word to this effect that the people had received certain intelligence that the good king of prussia travelled through the country under the name of a graf that my adjutant had been recognized and finally how great the joy was as they became certain that they really had me in the place they now saw clearly that i evidently desired to maintain the strictest incognito and how very wrong it had been to attempt so importunately to lift the veil but i had resented it so graciously so kindly i should certainly pardon their good-heartedness the thing appeared so amusing to the rogue that he did his best by reproving words the more to strengthen the good folk in their belief he made a very comical recital of all this and as he found that it diverted me he made a joke to me of his own additional wickedness shall i confess it it flattered me even by such means to be taken for that honoured head i commanded a feast to be prepared for the evening of the next day beneath the trees which overshadowed the open space before my house and the whole city to be invited to it the mysterious power of my purse the exertions of bendel and the active invention of rascal succeeded in triumphing over time itself it is really astonishing how richly and beautifully everything was arranged in those few hours the splendour and abundance which exhibited it themselves and the ingenious lighting up so admirably contrived that i felt myself quite secure left me nothing to desire i could not but praise my servants the evening grew dark the guests appeared and were presented to me nothing more was said about majesty i was styled with deep reverence and obeisance her graf what was to be done i allowed the her graf to please and remained from that hour the graf peter in the midst of festive multitudes my soul yearned alone after one she entered late she was and wore the crown she followed modestly her parents and seemed not to know that she was the loveliest of all they were presented to me as mr forrest master his lady and their daughter i found many agreeable and obliging things to say to the old people before the daughter i stood like a rebuked boy and could not bring out one word i begged her at length with a faltering tone to honour this feast by assuming the office whose insignia she graced she entreated with blushes and a moving look to be excused but blushing still more than herself in her presence i paid her as her first subject my homage with a most profound respect and the hints of the graf became to all the guests a command which every one with emulous joy hastened to obey majesty innocence and grace presided in alliance with beauty over a rapturous feast mina's happy parents believed their child only thus exalted in honour of them i myself was in indescribable intoxication I caused all the jewels which yet remained of those which I had formerly purchased in order to get rid of burdensome gold, all the pearls, all the precious stones, to be laid in two covered dishes, and at the table, in the name of the queen, to be distributed round to her companions and to all the ladies. Gold, in the meantime, was incessantly strewn over the enclosing lists among the exulting people. Bendel the next morning revealed to me in confidence that the suspicion which he had long entertained of rascal's honesty was now become certainty, 
that he had yesterday embezzled whole purses of gold let us permit replied i the poor scoundrel to enjoy the petty plunder i spend willingly on everybody why not on him yesterday he and all the fresh people you have brought me served me honestly they helped me joyfully to celebrate a joyful feast there was no further mention of it rascal remained the first of my servants but bendel was my friend and my confidant the latter was accustomed to regard my wealth as inexhaustible and he pried not after its sources entering into my humour he assisted me rather to discover opportunities to exercise it and to spend my gold of that unknown one that pale sneak he knew only this that i could alone through him be absolved from the curse which waited on me and that i feared him on whom my sole hope reposed that for the rest i was convinced that he could discover me anywhere i him nowhere and that therefore awaiting the promised day i abandoned every vain inquiry the magnificence of my feast and my behaviour at it held at first the credulous inhabitants of the city firmly to their preconceived opinion true it was soon stated in the newspapers that the whole story of the journey of the king of prussia had been a mere groundless rumour but a king i now was and must spite of everything a king remain and truly one of the most rich and royal who had ever existed only people did not rightly know what king the world had never had reason to complain of the scarcity of monarchs at least in our time the good people who had never seen any of them pitched with equal correctness first on one and then on another graf peter still remained who he was at one time appeared amongst the guests at a bath a tradesman who had made himself bankrupt in order to enrich himself and who enjoyed universal esteem and had a broad though somewhat pale shadow the property which he had scraped together he resolved to lay out in ostentation and it even occurred to him to enter into rivalry with me i had recourse to my purse and soon brought the poor fellow to such a pass that in order to save his credit he was obliged to become bankrupt a second time and hasten over the frontier thus i got rid of him in this neighbourhood i made many idlers and good-for-nothing fellows with all the royal splendour and expenditure by which i made all succumb to me i still in my own house lived very simply and retired i had established the strictest circumspection as a rule no one except bendel under any pretence whatever was allowed to enter the rooms which i inhabited so long as the sun shone i kept myself shut up there and it was said the graf is employed in his cabinet with this employment numerous couriers stood in connection whom i for every trifle sent out and received i received company only under my trees or in my hall arranged and lighted according to bendel's plan when i went out on which occasions it was necessary that i should be constantly watched by the artist's eyes of bendel it was only to the forester's garden for the sake of one alone for my love was the innermost heart of my life oh my good chamiso i will hope that thou hast not yet forgotten what love is mina was really an amiable kind good child i had taken her whole imagination captive she could not in her humility conceive how she could be worthy that i should have fixed my regard on her alone and she returned my love with all the youthful power of an innocent heart she loved like a woman offering herself wholly up self-forgetting living wholly and solely for him who was her life but i oh what terrible hours terrible and yet worthy that i should wish them back again have i often wept on bendel's bosom when after the first unconscious intoxication i recollected myself looked sharply into myself i without a shadow with knavish selfishness destroying this angel this pure soul then i did resolve to reveal myself to her then did i swear to tear myself from her and to fly then did i burst out into tears and concert with bendel how in the evening i should visit her in the forester's garden at other times i flattered myself with great expectations from the rapidly approaching visit from the grey man i wept again when i had in vain tried to believe in it i had calculated the day on which i expected again to see the fearful one for he had said in a year and a day and i believed his word the parents good honourable old people who loved their only child extremely were amazed and knew not what to do earlier they could not have believed that the graf peter could think only of their child but now he really loved her and was beloved again 
the mother was probably vain enough to believe in the probability of a marriage and to seek for it the sound masculine understanding of the father did not give way to such overstretched imaginations both were persuaded of the purity of my love they could do nothing more than pray for their child i have laid my hand on a letter from mina of this date which i still retain yes this is her own writing i transcribe it for thee thou canst imagine how the words must cut through my heart i explained to her that i was not what people believed me that i was only a rich but infinitely miserable man that a curse rested on me which must be the only secret between us since i was not yet without hope that it should be loosed that this was the poison of my days that i might drag her down with me into the gulf she who was the sole light the sole happiness the sole heart of my life then wept she again because i was unhappy ah she was so loving so kind to spare me but one tear she and with what transport would have sacrificed herself without reserve in the meantime she was far from rightly comprehending my words she conceived in me some prince on whom had fallen a heavy ban some high and honoured head and her imagination amidst heroic pictures limbed forth her lover gloriously once i said to her mina the last day in the next month may change my fate and decide it if not i must die for i will not make thee unhappy weeping she hid her head in my bosom if thy fortune changes let me know that thou art happy i have no claim on thee art thou wretched bind me to thy wretchedness and i may help thee to bear it maiden maiden take it back that word that foolish word which escaped thy lips and knowest thou this wretchedness knowest thou this curse knowest who thy love what he seest thou not that i convulsively shrink together and have a secret from thee she fell sobbing to my feet and repeated with tears her entreaty i announced to the forest-master who entered that it was my intention on the first approaching of the month to solicit the hand of his daughter i fixed precisely this time because in the interim many things might occur which might influence my fortunes that i was unchangeable in my love to his daughter the good man was quite startled as he heard such words out of the mouth of graf peter he fell on my neck and again became quite ashamed to have thus forgotten himself then he began to doubt to weigh and to inquire he spoke of dowry security and the fortune for his beloved child i thanked him for reminding me of these things i told him that i desired to settle myself in this country where i seemed to be beloved and to lead a carefree life i begged him to purchase the finest estate that his daughter had to offer in the name of his daughter and to charge the cost to me a father could in such matter best serve a lover it gave him enough to do for everywhere a stranger was before him and he could only purchase for about a million my thus employing him was at the bottom an instant scheme to remove him to a distance and i had employed him similarly before for i must confess that he was rather wearisome the good mother was on the contrary somewhat deaf and not like him jealous of the honour of entertaining the graf the mother joined us the happy people pressed me to stay longer with them that evening i dared not remain another minute i saw already the rising moon glimmer on the horizon my time was up the next evening i went again to the forester's garden i had thrown my cloak over my shoulders and pulled my hat over my eyes i advanced to mina as she looked up and beheld me she gave an involuntary start and there stood again clear before my soul the apparition of that terrible night when i showed myself in the moonlight without a shadow it was actually she but had she also recognized me she was silent and thoughtful on my bosom lay a hundredweight pressure i arose from my seat she threw herself silently weeping on my bosom i went i now found her often in tears it grew darker and darker in my soul the parents meanwhile swam in supreme felicity the eventful day passed on sad and sullen as a thundercloud the eve of the day was come i could scarcely breathe i had in precaution filled several chests with gold i watched the midnight hour approach it struck i now sat my eye fixed on the fingers of the clock counting the minutes the seconds like dagger strokes at every noise which arose i started the day broke the leaden hours crowded upon each other it was noon evening night as the clock fingers sped on 
hope withered it struck eleven and nothing appeared the last minutes of the last hour fell and nothing appeared it struck the first stroke the last stroke of the twelfth hour and i sank hopeless and in boundless tears upon my bed the morrow i should forever shadowless solicit the hand of my beloved towards morning an anxious sleep pressed down my eyelids End of chapter 4 Recording by Ashley M. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemil, The Man Who Lost His Shadow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb the Wonderful History of Peter Schlemil, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adelbert von Chamisso, translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 5. Footnote. This chapter, with the three succeeding ones, is occupied in working out, in a strikingly original way, the mythical doctrine, so common in the folklore of the Middle Age, of the sale of the soul to the devil in return for riches and pleasure. It is a new variation of the Faust legend. The mysterious man in the grey coat is a companion character to the Mephistopheles of Goethe, and the victim, after the disastrous failure of his experiment and his desperate repudiation of the compact, becomes a powerfully reminiscent fantasia of the wandering Jew. The shadow of Schlemil is the symbol of his immortal soul, according to the immemorial beliefs of the early world, as evidenced in language by the Eidolon of the Greeks and the Umbra of the Romans, and the synonym Shade and Ghost in English. In his development of the story, Chamiso treats these notions with an exquisite combination of wit and humor, dialectic skill and literary felicity, which the reader will do well to study carefully. End of footnote. It was still early morning when voices, which were raised in my antechamber in violent dispute, awoke me. I listened. Bendel forbade entrance. Rascal swore high and hotly that he would receive no commands from his fellow, and insisted in forcing his way into my room. The good Bendel warned him that such words, came they to my ear, would turn him out of his most advantageous service. Rascal threatened to lay hands on him if he any longer obstructed his entrance. I had half-dressed myself. I flung the door wrathfully open and advanced to Rascal. What wantest thou, villain? He stepped two strides backwards and replied quite coolly, To request you most humbly, Herr Graf, just to allow me to see your shadow. The sun shines at this moment so beautifully in the court. I was struck as if with thunder. It was some time before I could recover my speech. How can a servant towards his master? He interrupted very calmly my speech. A servant may be a very honorable man, and not be willing to serve a shadowless master. I demand my discharge. It was necessary to try other chords. But honest, dear rascal, who has put the unlucky idea into your head? How canst thou believe? He proceeded in the same tone. People will assert that you have no shadow, and in short, you show me your shadow, or give my discharge. Bendel, pale and trembling, but more discreet than I, gave me a sign. I sought refuge in the all-silencing gold, and that had lost its power. He threw it at my feet. From a shadowless man, I accept nothing. He turned his back upon me and went most deliberately out of the room, with his hat upon his head and whistling a tune. I stood there with Bendel, as one turned to stone, thoughtless, motionless, gazing after him. Heavily sighing, and with death in my heart, I prepared myself to redeem my promise, and like a criminal before his judge, to appear in the forest master's garden. I alighted in the dark arbor, which was named after me, and where they would be sure also at this time to await me. The mother met me, carefree and joyous. Mina sat there, pale and lovely as the first snow which often in the autumn kisses the last flowers and then instantly dissolves into bitter water. The forest master went agitatedly to and fro, a written paper in his hand, and appeared to force down many things in himself 
which painted themselves with rapidly alternating flushes and paleness on his otherwise immovable countenance. He came up to me as I entered, and with frequently choked words begged to speak with me alone. The path in which he invited me to follow him conducted towards an open, sunny part of the garden. I sank speechless on a seat, and then followed a long silence which even the good mother dared not interrupt. The forest master raged continually with unequal steps to and fro in the arbor, and suddenly halting before me, glanced on the paper which he held and demanded of me with a searching look, May not, Herr Graf, a certain Peter Schlemil be not quite unknown to you? I was silent. A man of superior character and singular attainments. He paused for an answer. And suppose I were the same man. Who, added he vehemently, has by some means lost his shadow? Oh, my foreboding, my foreboding, exclaimed Mina. Yes, I have long known it. He has no shadow. And she flung herself into the arms of her mother, who, terrified, clasped her convulsively and upbraided her that to her own hurt she had kept herself to such a secret. But she, like Arethusa, was changed into a fountain of tears, which at the sound of my voice flowed still more copiously, and at my approach burst forth in torrents. And you, again, grimly began the forest master, and you, with unparalleled impudence, have made no scruple to deceive these and myself, and you give out that you love her whom you have so deeply humbled. See there how she weeps and writhes. Oh, horrible, horrible. I had to such a degree lost all reflection that, talking like one crazed, I began. And after all, a shadow is nothing but a shadow. One can do very well without that and it is not worthwhile to make such a riot about it. But I felt so sharply the baselessness of what I was saying that I stopped of myself without his deigning me an answer, and I then added, What one has lost at one time may be found again at another. He rushed fiercely towards me. Confess to me, sir, confess to me, how became you deprived of your shadow? I was compelled again to lie, a rude fellow one day trod so heavily on my shadow that he rent a great hole in it. I have only sent it to be mended, for money can do much, and I was to have received it back yesterday. Good, sir, very good, replied the forest master. You solicit my daughter's hand. Others do the same. I have, as her father, to care for her. I give you three days in which you may see after a shadow. If you appear before me within these three days with a good, well-fitting shadow, you shall be welcome to me. But on the fourth day, I tell you plainly, my daughter is the wife of another. I would yet attempt to speak a word to Mina, but she clung, sobbing violently, only closer to her mother's breast, who motioned me to be silent and to withdraw. I reeled away and the world seemed to close itself behind me. Escaped from Bendel's affectionate oversight, I traversed an erring coarse woods and fields. The perspiration of my agony dripped from my brow. A hollow groaning convulsed my bosom. Madness raged within me. I know not how long this had continued, when, on a sunny heath, I felt myself plucked by the sleeve. I stood still and looked round. It was the man in the grey coat, who seemed to have run himself quite out of breath in pursuit of me. He immediately began. I had announced myself for today, but you cannot wait the time. There is nothing amiss, however, yet. You consider the matter, receive your shadow again in exchange, which is at your service, and turn immediately back. You shall be welcome in the forest master's garden. The whole has been only a joke. Rascal, who has betrayed you, and who seeks the hand of your bride, I will take charge of. The fellow is ripe. I stood there as still asleep. Announced for today? I counted over again the time. He was right. I had constantly miscalculated a day. I saw it with the right hand in my bosom for my purse. He guessed my meeting and stepped two paces backwards. 
No, Herr Graf, that is in two good hands. Keep you that. I stared at him with eyes of inquiring wonder, and he proceeded. I request only a trifle as memento. You be so good as to set your name to this paper. On the parchment stood the words. By virtue of this signature, I make over my soul to the holder of this, after its natural separation from the body. I gazed with speechless amazement, alternately at the writing and the gray unknown. Meanwhile, with a new-made pen, he had taken up a drop of blood, which flowed from a fresh thorn scratch on my hand, and presented it to me. Who are you, then? At length I asked him. What signifies it? He replied. And is not that plain enough to be seen in me? A poor devil, a sort of learned man and doctor, who in return for precious arts receives from his friends poor thanks, and for himself has no other amusement on earth but to make his little experiments. But, however, sign. To the right there, Peter Schlemil. I shook my head and said, Pardon me, sir, I do not sign that. Not, he replied in amaze, and why not? It seems to me a certain degree serious to stake my soul on a shadow. So, so, repeated he, serious, and he laughed almost in my face. And if I might venture to ask, what sort of a thing is that soul of yours? Have you seen it? And what do you think of doing with it when you are dead? Be glad that you have found an amateur who in your lifetime is willing to pay you for the bequest of this X, of his galvanic power or polarized activity, or whatever the silly thing may be, with something actual. That is to say, with your real shadow, through which you may arrive at the hand of your beloved and at the accomplishments of all your desires. Will you rather push forth and deliver up that poor young creature to that low-bred scoundrel rascal? No, you must witness that with your own eyes. Here, I lend you the tarn cap, the cap of invisibility. He drew it from his pocket. And we will proceed unseen to the forester's garden. I must confess that I was excessively ashamed of being ridiculed by this man, I detested him from the bottom of my heart, and I believed that this personal antipathy withheld me, more than principle or prejudice, from purchasing my shadow, essential as it was, by the required signature. The thought also was intolerable of me making the excursion which he proposed in his company. To see this abhorred sneak, this mocking cobalt, step between me and my beloved, Two torn and bleeding hearts revolted my innermost feeling. I regarded what was past as predestined, and my wretchedness as unchangeable, and turning to this man, I said to him, Sir, I have sold you my shadow for this in itself most excellent purse, and I have sufficiently repented of it. Let the bargain be at an end in God's name. He shook his head and made a very gloomy face. I continued, I will then sell you nothing further of mine, even for this offered price of my shadow, and therefore I shall sign nothing. From this you may understand that the cap wearing to which you invite me must be much more amusing for you than for me. Excuse me, therefore, and as it cannot be otherwise, let us part. It grieves me, Herr Schlemel, that you would obstinately decline the business which I propose to you. Perhaps another time I may be more fortunate. Till our speedy meeting again, apropos, permit me yet to show you that the things which I purchase I by no means suffer to grow moldy, but honorably preserve, and that they are well used by me. With that, he drew my shadow out of his pocket, and with a dexterous throw, unfolding it on the heath, spread it out on the sunny side of his feet, so that he walked between two attendant shadows, his own and mine, for mine must equally obey him, and accommodate itself to and follow all his movements. When I once saw my poor shadow again, 
after so long an absence and beheld it degraded to so vile a service whilst i on its account was in such unspeakable trouble my heart broke and i began bitterly to weep the detested wretch swaggered with the plunder snatched from me and impudently renewed his proposal you can yet have it a stroke of the pen and you can snatch therewith the poor unhappy mina from the claws of the villain into the arms of the most honoured hergraf as observed only a stroke of the pen my tears burst forth with fresh impetuosity and i turned away and motioned to him to withdraw himself bendel who filled with anxiety had traced me to this spot at this moment arrived when the kind good soul found me weeping and saw my shadow which could not be mistaken in the power of the mysterious gray man he immediately resolved were it even by force to restore to me the possession of my property and as he did not understand going much about with tender phrases he immediately assaulted the man with words and without much asking ordered him bluntly to allow that which was my own instantly to follow me instead of answer he turned his back and went but bendel up with his buckthorn cudgel which he carried and following on his heels without mercy and with reiterated commands to give up the shadow made him feel the full force of his vigorous arm he as accustomed to such handling ducked his head set up his shoulders and with silent and deliberate steps pursued his way over the heath at once going off with my shadow and my faithful servant i long heard the heavy sounds roll over the waste till they were finally lost in the distance i was alone as before with my misery End of chapter 5. Recording by Megan Lamb. Chapter 6 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow by Delbert von Chamiso Translated by Frederick Henry Hedge Chapter 6 Left alone on the wild heath, I gave free current to my countless tears, relieving my heart from an ineffably weary weight. But I saw no bound, no outlet, no end to my intolerable misery, and I drank besides with savage thirst of the fresh poison which the unknown had poured into my wounds. When I called the image of Mina before my soul, and the dear sweet form appeared pale and in tears, as I saw her last in my shame, then stepped the shadow of the impudent and mocking rascal between her and me, I covered my face and fled through the wild, but the hideous apparition left me not, but pursued me in my flight till I sank breathless on the ground and moistened it with a fresh torrent of tears. And all for a shadow! And this shadow a pen-stroke had obtained for me. I thought on the strange proposition in my refusal. All was chaos in me. I had no longer either judgment or mastership of thought. The day went over. I stilled my hunger with wild fruits, my thirst in the nearest mountain stream. The night fell. I lay down beneath a tree. The damp morning awoke me out of a heavy sleep in which I heard myself rattle in the throat as in death. Bendel must have lost all trace of me, and it rejoiced me to think so. I would not return again amongst men before whom I fled in terror like the timid game of the mountains. Thus, I lived through three weary days. On the fourth morning, I found myself on a sunny plain, bright with the sun, and sate on the fragment of a rock in its beams, for I loved now to enjoy its long-withheld countenance. I still fed my heart with its despair. A light rustle startled me. 
ready for flight i threw round me a hurried glance i saw no one but in the sunny sand there glided past me a human shadow not unlike my own which wandering there alone seemed to have gotten away from its possessor footnote the notion of a human shadow escaping from its possessor and independently wandering about by itself on the sunny sand is a delightful absurdity of the most willful sort reminding us of the laughable extravagancies of munchison it is a satire on that empirical philosophy which holds that the material order is the elusive reality the ideal order an empty delusion those who think thus reach only vacant and quasi-universals more collections by abstractive generalizations from physical phenomena instead of rising to the creative archetypes in the exemplar mind of the first principle from whose external substance all else is derivative shadows and reflections they entirely overlook the necessary presuppositions without whose coedition and cooperation no physical object could possibly exist number force space time motion are not material phenomena but are the logical conditions requisite for the emergence of any such show now logical conditions imply the logos as every thinking carries a thinker hence material phenomena themselves prove and reveal the existence of spirit purpose self-determined expression and these concepts so far from being vacuous abstracts are the primordial concretes the ideal realities which lead to our intuitive contemplation god freedom and immortality no abstraction whatever can exist save as the act of an abstractor every abstraction is self-evidently the result of an abstracting act performed upon pre-existing concreteness all the contents of these freighted propositions are obviously involved in the unquestionable fact that no shadow can possibly appear in the order of sense except as the direct consequence of causes previously existence and operative in the ideal order a shadow is the unsubstantial form thrown on some supporting ground by an object whose opaque matter obstructs the light and excludes it from the outlined area behind it is not an entity at all it is absolutely incapable of independence it is in its ultimate definition purely a phenomenal modification resulting from the interaction of other phenomena but all phenomena are revelatory manifestations of their hidden causes every phenomenon is the apparitional unveiling of its noumenon furthermore all phenomena and all noumena are interrelated in one continuous system of reality each part of which is pervaded and unified by the indivisible whole we can no more account for our human experience without the causative ideas of god purposiveness liberty infinity then we can understand the production of an abstract shadow without presupposing the concrete reality of a ground a light and an intervening body End of footnote. There awoke in me a mighty yearning. Shadow, said I, dost thou seek thy master? I will be he. And I sprang forward to seize it. I thought that if I succeeded in treading on it so that its feet touched mine, it would probably remain hanging there and in time accommodate itself to me. The shadow, on my moving, fled before me, and I was compelled to begin a strenuous chase of the light fugitive for which only the thought of rescuing myself from my fearful condition could have endowed me with the requisite vigor. It flew towards a wood at a great distance, in which I must of necessity have lost it. I perceived this. A horror convulsed my heart, inflamed my desire, added wings to my speed. I gained evidently on the shadow. I came continually nearer. I must certainly reach it. Suddenly it stopped and turned toward me. Like a lion on its prey, I shot with a mighty spring forward to make seizure of it and dashed unexpectedly against a hard object. Invisibly, I received the most terrible blows on the ribs that mortal man ever felt. The effect of the terror in me 
was convulsively to close my arms and firmly to enclose that which stood unseen before me. In the rapid transaction, I plunged forward to the ground, but behind and under me was a man whom I had embraced and who now first became visible. The whole occurrence became now very naturally explicable to me. The man must have carried the invisible bird's nest, which renders him who holds it, but not his shadow, imperceptible, and had now cast it away. I glanced round, soon discovered the shadow of the invisible nest itself, leaped up and towards it, and did not miss the precious prize. Invisible and shadowless, I held the nest in my hand. The man swiftly springing up, gazing round instantly after his fortunate conqueror, described on the wide sunny plain neither him nor his shadow, for which he sought with especial avidity. For that I was myself entirely shadowless, he had no leisure to remark, nor could he imagine such a thing. Having convinced himself that every trace had vanished, he turned his head against himself and tore his hair. To me, however, the acquired treasure had given the power and desire to mix again amongst men. I did not want for self-satisfying palliatives for my base robbery, or rather, I had no need of them. And to escape from every thought of the kind, I hastened away, not even looking round at the unhappy one, whose deploring voice I long heard resounding behind me. Thus, at least, appeared to me the circumstances at the time. I was on fire to proceed to the forester's garden, and there myself to discern the truth of what the detested one had told me. I knew not, however, where I was. I climbed the next hill in order to look round over the country, and perceived from its summit the near city and the forester's garden lying at my feet. My heart beat violently, and tears of another kind than what I had till now shed rushed into my eyes. I should see her again. Anxious desires hastened my steps down the most direct path. I passed unseen some peasants who came out of the city. They were talking of me, of Rascal, and the forest master. I would hear nothing. I hurried past. I entered the garden, all the tremor of expectation in my bosom. I seemed to hear laughter near me. I shuddered, threw a rapid glance round me, but could discover nobody. I advanced further. I seemed to perceive a sound as of a man's step at hand, but there was nothing to be seen. I believed myself deceived by my ear. It was yet early, no one in Graf Peter's arbor, the garden still empty. I traversed the well-known paths. I penetrated to the very front of the dwelling. The same noise more distinctly followed me. I seated myself with an agonized heart on a bench which stood in the sunny space before the house door. It seemed to me as if I had heard the unseen kobold, laughing in mockery, seat himself near me. The key turned in the door and it opened, and the forest master issued forth with papers in his hand. A mist seemed to envelop my head. I looked up in horror. The man in the gray coat sat by me, gazing on me with a satanic leer. He had drawn his tarn cap at once over his head and mine. At his feet lay his and my shadow peacefully by each other. He played negligently with the well-known paper which he held in his hand, and as the forest master, busied with his documents, went to and fro in the shadow of the arbor, he stooped familiarly to my ear and whispered in it these words. So, then, you have notwithstanding accepted my invitation, and here sit we for once two heads under one cap. All right, all right. But now give me my bird's nest again. You have no further occasion for it, and are too honorable a man to wish to withhold it from me. But there needs no thanks. I assure you that I have lent it to you with the most hearty good will. He took it unceremoniously out of my hand, put it in his pocket, and laughed at me, and that so loud that the forest master himself looked round at the noise. I sat there as if changed to stone. But you must allow, continued he, that such a cap is much more convenient. It covers not only your person, but your shadow at the same time, 
and as many others as you have a mind to take with you. See you today again. I conduct two of them. He laughed again. Mark this, Schlemiel. What we at first won't do with a good will, that will we in the end be compelled to do. I still fancy you will buy that thing from me, take back the bride, for it is yet time, and we leave rascal dangling on the gallows, an easy thing for us so long as rope is to be had. Hear you, I will give you also my cap into the bargain. The mother came forth, and the conversation began. How goes it with Mina? She weeps. Silly child, it cannot be altered. Certainly not, but to give her to another so soon. Oh man, thou art cruel to thy own child. No, mother, that thou quite mistakest. When she, even before she has wept out her childish tears, finds herself the wife of a very rich and honorable man, she will awake comforted out of her trouble as out of a dream, and thank God and us. That will thou see. God grant it. She possesses now indeed a very respectable property, but after the stir that this unlucky affair with the adventurer has made, canst thou believe that a partner so suitable as Mr. Rascal could be readily found for her? Dost thou know what a fortune Mr. Rascal possesses? He has paid six millions for estates here in the country, free from all debits. I have had the title deeds in my own hands. He, it was who everywhere had the start of me, and besides this, has in his possession bills on Thomas John for about five and a half millions. He must have stolen enormously. What talk is that again? He has widely saved what would otherwise have been lavished away. A man that has worn livery. Stupid stuff. He has, however, an unblemished shadow. Thou art right, but... The man in the gray coat laughed and looked at me. The door opened and Mina came forth. She supported herself on the arm of a chambermaid. Silent tears rolled down her lovely pale cheeks. She seated herself on a stool, which was placed for her under the lime trees, and her father took a chair by her. He tenderly took her hand and addressed her with tender words while she began violently to weep. Thou art my good... Dear child, and thou wilt be reasonable, will not wish to distress thy old father who seeks only thy happiness. I can well conceive it, dear heart, that it has sadly shaken thee. Thou art wonderfully escaped from thy misfortunes. Before we discovered the scandalous imposition, thou hast loved this unworthy one greatly. See, Mina, I know it, and upbraid thee not for it. I myself, dear child, also loved him so long as I looked upon him as a great gentleman. But now thou seest how different all has turned out. What? Every poodle has his own shadow, and should my dear child have a husband? No, thou thinkest indeed no more about him. Listen, Mina. Now a man solicits thy hand who does not shun the sunshine, an honorable man who truly is no prince, but who possesses ten millions, ten times more than thou, a man who will make my dear child happy. Answer me not, make no opposition, be my good, dutiful daughter, let thy loving father care for thee and dry thy tears. Promise me to give thy hand to Mr. Rascal. Say, wilt thou promise me this? She answered with a faint voice, I have no will, no wish further upon earth. Happen with me what my father will. At this moment, Mr. Rascal was announced and stepped impudently into the circle. Mina lay in a swoon. My detested companion glanced archly at me and whispered in hurried words, And that can you endure? What then flows instead of blood in your veins? He scratched with a hasty movement a single wound in my hand. Blood flowed, and he continued, actually red blood so sign then i had the parchment and the pen in my hand end of chapter 6 recording by megan lamb
Chapter 7 of The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Wonderful History of Peter Schlemiel, The Man Who Lost His Shadow, by Adelbert von Chamiso. Translated by Frederick Henry Hedge. Chapter 7 My wish, dear Chamiso, is merely to submit myself to thy judgment, not to endeavor to bias it. I have long passed the severest sentence on myself, for I have nourished the tormenting worm in my heart. It hovered, during this solemn moment of my life, incessantly before my soul, and I could only lift my eyes to it with a despairing glance, with humility and contrition. Dear friend, he who in levity only sets his foot out of the right road is unawares conducted into other paths which draw him downwards and ever downwards. He then sees in vain the guiding stars glitter in heaven. There remains to him no choice. He must descend unpausingly the declivity and become a voluntary sacrifice to Nemesis. After the false step which had laid the curse upon me, I had, sinning through love, forced myself into the fortunes of another being. And what remained for me but that where I had sowed destruction, where speedy salvation was demanded of me, I should blindly rush forward to the rescue? For the last hour struck. Think not so meanly of me, my Adelbear, as to imagine that I should have regarded any price that was demanded as too high, that I should have begrudged anything that was mine, even more than my gold. No, Adelbert, but my soul was possessed with the most unconquerable hatred of this mysterious speaker along crooked paths. I might do him injustice, but every degree of association with him maddened me. And here stepped forth, as so frequently in my life, and as especially often in the history of the world, an event instead of an action. Since then I have achieved reconciliation with myself. I have learned, in the first place, to reverence necessity, and what is more than the action performed, the event accomplished, her property. Then I have learned to venerate this necessity, as a wise providence which lives through that great collective machine in which we officiate simply as cooperating, impelling, and impelled wheels. What shall be, must be. What should be, happened, and not without that providence which I ultimately learned to reverence in my own fate, and in the fate of her on whom mine thus impinged. I know not whether I shall ascribe it to the excitement of my soul under the impulse of such mighty sensations, or to the exhaustion of my physical strength, which during the last days such unwonted privations had enfeebled, or whether, finally, to the desolating commotion which the presence of this grey fiend excited in my whole nature, be that as it may, as I was on the point of signing, I fell into a deep swoon and lay a long time as in the arms of death. Stamping of feet and curses were the first sounds which struck my ear as I returned to consciousness. I opened my eyes. It was dark. My detested attendant was busy scolding about me. Is not that to behave like an old woman? Up with you, man, and complete offhand what you have resolved on, if you have not taken another thought, and had rather blubber. I raised myself with difficulty from the ground, and gazed in silence around. It was late in the evening. Festive music resounded from the brightly illuminated forester's house. Various groups of people wandered through the garden walks. One couple came near in conversation, and seated themselves on the bench which I had just quitted. They talked of the union this morning solemnized between Mr. Rascal and the daughter of the house. So then, it had taken place. I tore the tarn cap of the already vanished unknown from my head, 
and hastened in brooding silence towards the garden gate plunging myself into the deepest night of the thicket and striking along the path past graf peter's arbor but invisibly my tormenting spirit accompanied me pursuing me with the keenest reproaches these then are one's thanks for the pains which one has taken to support you who have weak nerves through the long precious day and one shall act the fool in the play good mr wronghead fly you from me if you please but we are nevertheless inseparable you have my gold and i your shadow and this will allow us no repose did anybody ever hear of a shadow forsaking its master yours draws me after you till you take it again into favor and i get rid of it what you have hesitated to do out of fresh pleasure will you only too late be compelled to seek through new weariness and disgust one cannot escape one's fate he continued speaking in the same tone i fled in vain he relaxed not but ever present insultingly talked of gold and shadow i could come to no single thought of my own i struck through unfrequented ways towards my house when i stood before it and gazed at it i could scarcely recognize it no light shone through the dashed-in windows the doors were closed no throng of servants was moving therein there was a laugh near me ha <laughs> ha so goes it but you'll probably find your bendel at home for he was the other day purposely sent back so weary that he has most likely kept his bed since he laughed again he will have a story to tell well then for the present good night we meet speedily again i had rung repeatedly light appeared bindle demanded from within who rung when the good man recognized my voice he could scarcely restrain his joy the door flew open and we stood weeping in each other's arms i found him greatly changed weak and ill but for me my hair had become quite gray he conducted me through the desolated rooms to an inner apartment which had been spared he brought food and wine and we seated ourselves and he again began to weep he related to me that he the other day had cudgelled the grey-clad man whom he had encountered with my shadow so long and so far that he had lost all trace of me and had sunk to the earth in utter fatigue that after this as he could not find me he returned home whither presently the mob at rascal's instigation came rushing in fury dashed in the windows and gave full play to their lust of demolition thus did they to their benefactor the servants had fled various ways the police had ordered me as a suspicious person to quit the city and had allowed only four and twenty hours in which to get out of their jurisdiction to that which i already knew of rascal's affluence and marriage he had yet much to add this scoundrel from whom all had proceeded that had been done against me must from the beginning have been in possession of my secret it appeared that attracted by gold he had contrived to thrust himself upon me and at the very first had procured a key to the gold cupboard where he had laid the foundation of that fortune whose augmentation he could now afford to despise all this bindle narrated to me with abundant tears and then wept for joy that he again beheld me again had me and that after he had long doubted whither his misfortune might have led me he saw me bear it so calmly and collectedly for such an aspect had despair now assumed in me i beheld my misery unchangeably before me i had wept out to it my last tear not another cry could be exhorted from my heart i presented to it my bare head with chill indifference bindle i said thou knowest my lot not without earlier blame has my heavy punishment befallen me thou innocent man shalt no longer bind thy destiny to mine i do not desire it i ride to-night still forward saddle me a horse i ride alone thou remainest it is my will 
here still must remain some chests of gold that retain thou but i will alone wander incessantly through the world but if ever a happier hour should smile upon me and fortune look on me with reconciled eyes then will i remember thee for i have wept upon thy firmly faithful bosom in heavy and agonizing hours with a broken heart was this honest man compelled to obey this last command of his master at which his soul shrunk with terror i was deaf to his prayers to his representations blind to his tears he brought me out of my steed once more i pressed the weeping man to my bosom sprang into the saddle and under the shroud of night hastened from the grave of my existence regardless which way my horse conducted me since i had longer on the earth no aim no wish no hope end of chapter seven recording by james k white chula vista